to, Steve talked about this Friday night, and I would like to go back over it again because it tells us what, what God is doing in our lives with his word. In 1 Corinthians 2, verse 6, it says, When we are among the full-grown, spiritually mature Christians who are ripe in understanding, boy, God thinks a lot about us, doesn't he? We do impart a higher wisdom, the knowledge of the divine plan, previously hidden, but indeed it is not a wisdom of this present age or of this world, nor of the leaders or the rulers of this age. You know, right now over in England, uh, the G7 summit is happening, and after that I understand that uh, President Biden is going to meet with President Putin of Russia, and you know, the, the world thinks that there's something really important about that. Well, I'm not going to say it's not important as to how it will affect people's lives, but God is showing us some things, I dare say, that those guys are not going to see. Right, and, but rather, we are setting forth a wisdom of God once hidden from human understanding and now revealed to us by God. That wisdom which God has devised and decreed before the ages for our glorification. Now, I know if you have the Amplified Bible, it says that glorification lifts us into the glory of God's presence. Well, that's not all that God's glory does. I mean, it does lift us into his presence. But I look that word up. In the King James, it's, it says just glory. Uh, decreed before the ages for our glory. I think the number in Strong's is 1391. And this is interesting because it does mean uh, glory and honor and fame and you know, to be um, a celebrity, I guess I would say. But the actual root of the word, let's see, got something to write with here. The actual root of the word means to be very apparent. If something is apparent, it has manifested. It's out there to be seen. You know, like it says in Malachi chapter 3, verse 17, uh, that, that God will display us as his jewels, and so then the world will return and discern between those who serve God and those who don't. God's wisdom is given to us so that people out there can tell that we belong to him. So that's, that's what he's talking about here. That's the work. That's God's agenda for us. That's why we're here. And in verse 8 it says, None of the rulers of this age or world perceived or recognized or understood this. For if they had, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. Well, that verse there tells us a mouthful. It says, none of the rulers of this world. It's like, oh, well, okay, yeah, I, I understand about, you know, the communists, they don't know, and in Venezuela, they don't know, and in the third world, they don't know, but we Americans, we know. Uh-uh. It says, none of the rulers of this world. Well, why would he say that? I mean, aren't there, aren't there good rulers and bad rulers? I mean, what happened to good King Wenceslas, you know? That was the piece. The first piano recital I played was a Christmas recital, and I had to play Good King Wenceslas. <laughs> well, I'm sorry to tell you there ain't no good kings. Every king has one job and one job only, and that's self-preservation for himself and the people within his territory, supposedly. Of course, even there, some kings will decide that a majority of the people within their territory are, are useless eaters, and he'll get rid of them. No, the... 
the, the nature of the flesh is self-preservation. And it says there, I mean, it, it, does, it says between the lines there in verse 8 that self-preservation is anti-Christ. We don't think of that that way. We think, well, well, God wants us to take care of ourselves. I mean, God helps those who help themselves, and, and God wants me to look after number one. He does want you to look after number one. He wants to be number one, right? Okay, verse 9. But on the contrary, as the Scripture says, what eye has not seen and ear has not heard. And this goes back to what Ellen was saying. There's stuff going on that you are not going to see on the mainstream news. And there's stuff really you're not going to see the full explanation of it on the alternative media either. There's stuff going on in this world that the devil has so far hidden below the surface that he thinks he's going to go undetected. But the Holy Spirit reveals those things to God's people if we're listening. What eye has not seen and ear has not heard and it has not entered into the heart of man, all that God has prepared and made and keeps ready for those who love him, who hold him in affectionate reverence, promptly obeying and gratefully recognizing the benefits that he has bestowed. Okay, go now to Ezekiel chapter 14. We've been doing this series, you know, about surviving the coming cataclysm, or you can call it a holocaust if you want to. And in verse 13, Ezekiel 14, 13, it says, Son of man, when a land sins against me. You know, there can be cultural sins as well as individual sins. There, there can be things that a whole group of people are doing that's displeasing to God just as much as there's things that each one of us could do that are displeasing to God. And if you are in that land, then if that land is displeasing to God, you, you're going to see uh, the, the effects of that. It says, if the land sins against me by committing a trespass and I stretch out my hand against it, if God stretches out his hand against America, you're going to notice it. Okay? And break the staff of bread or send famine upon it or cut it off from it, man and beast. Even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they would save but their own lives by their righteousness their uprightness and right standing with me, says the Lord God. Noah, Daniel, and Job. We talked last week about Noah. This week we've been talking about Daniel. And so we're going to talk today about how to be a Daniel. God wants us to be Daniels. Well, how do we be a Daniel? <clears throat> That's what we're going to talk about today. <clears throat> but first, <clears throat> pardon me, go to verse 22. There is something here. I think the best way for me to depict this, let me read verse 22. It says, And behold, in it shall be left a remnant, an escaped portion, <clears throat> both of sons and daughters. See, in verse 14, it said, uh, even if Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they would save only themselves. Well, that sounds like, well, uh, you know, forget about your, your, uh, your kids. They're, they're, they're a lost cause. Well, no, because here in verse 22, it says, but there will be left a remnant, an escaped portion, both of sons and daughters, <clears throat> well, that's good news. It says, They shall be carried forth to you, and when you see their walk and their doings, you will be consoled for the evil that I have brought upon Jerusalem 
even concerning all that I have brought upon it. So we have, of course, in Acts 16.31, a promise that if we'll believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we'll be saved and our households. But how is this, how is this going to work? Well, the best way I can explain it is with a, a diagram. I love diagrams. Don't you love diagrams? <clears throat> okay. All right. This is an orange. Well, you're close, but no, it's <laughs> This is what I would call the Christian bubble. You know, if you're a born again Christian, you're inside the Christian bubble. All right? Now, I use that term <clears throat> advisedly because that is sometimes used disparagingly of Christians in our society. It's like, well, you know, you are, you know, you, you were, you know, setting yourselves apart from the rest of the world. You know, you think you're better than everybody else. A and, uh, you know, you, you think you are entitled to things the rest of the world is not. Okay, so <clears throat> this is not necessarily God's term. But we're in it. Okay, I'll put a little, another little circle up here, and this will be, uh, I'll say Romans 8, but I mean that could be any of God's people who are really in their hearts trying to walk with Jesus, okay? We're inside the Christian bubble. But we've got loved ones who were not inside the Christian bubble. Okay, I'll, I'll just put an F for family, right? Or, or loved ones, friends, people that you're close to, spouses, whoever. I mean, okay. Sooner or later, when judgment comes upon the land, uh, the bubble bursts. Well, who, who's going to be closest to us. The, the rest of the body of Christ out here? No. How about the ones that, that our lives touch? What I just read there in Ezekiel 14 gives us encouragement that those that you're living the Christian life in front of will, will be more influenced by your walk with the Lord even than some of the other Methobabda Presbycostals out there. They're closer to you. So these are the ones that God is training us to be Daniels in front of. Okay, just wanting to make this clear as we go forward. You do have a promise that your loved ones can be brought in, even though right now they're outside the Christian bubble. Well, I, this, the point making here is that getting inside the Christian bubble is not, is not what God's trying to do. And, and, you know, I don't think a lot of the, the church world realizes that. I think they think that God's agenda is to try to make that bubble as big as possible. You know, bring them in. We don't care how you get here, folks. Just get here. Well, sooner or later, those bubbles burst. And, and where are they then? Well, you're going to have to have the Word. And this is what God is doing with us. I just thought I'd share that. Okay. Go to Daniel chapter 1. We're going to spend a lot of time in Daniel today. Because the title is How to Be a Daniel. Right? Well, I'm going to give you four things. Maybe throw in a fifth one for good measure about what being a Daniel would mean for us. In fact, I'll write these guys down too. First of all, well, let's just start verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, 
king of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Well, there's an example of that judgment that comes upon a land that Ezekiel was warning about. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and his house, along with a part of the vessels of the house of God, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. And he carried them into the land of Shinar to the house of his God and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. And the Babylonian king told Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, to bring in <clears throat> some of the children of Israel, <clears throat> both of the royal family and of the nobility. We talked about that on Tuesday night. Youths without blemish well-favored in appearance and skillful in all wisdom, discernment, and understanding, apt in learning knowledge, competent to stand and serve in the king's palace, and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. Well, there you see the bubble burst. Uh, the the Judeo bubble had burst and they were no longer in a protected land they were no longer um, under the the shadow of the Almighty well they really were these guys were the ones we're going to study today but by and large the culture was destroyed I mean they took the stuff out of God's temple and put it in the temple of an idol well, why did God let that happen? Because God warned them that that would happen if they quit walking with Him and started serving those idols. God doesn't care about stuff. We Americans care about stuff. That building was just brick and mortar. God doesn't dwell in buildings made with hands. He dwells in human hearts. The building was just a symbol. And when, they, when he was not dwelling in their hearts anymore, why have a symbol of something that was not a reality? And that's where, where things are going, you see. So, uh, keep the place here. Go to John chapter 17. So, when judgment came, God still had a remnant. John chapter 17, verse 15. This is Jesus praying to the Father and He says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world. Well, see, that, that right there says that the Christian bubble is not a God thing. God did not intend His people to be uh, in an enclave where they were hermetically sealed and had no contact with outside influences. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you will keep and protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world as I am not of the world. Sanctify them, separate them for yourself, and make them holy by the truth. Your word is the truth. What we are saying here that Daniel and his three friends, go back to Daniel, were, was, they were, just like Jesus said there, they were in the world, but they were not of it. Well, that sort of sounds like an oxymoron. It's like, well, how can you be in it but not be of it? Well, Jesus told you 
by the word being in you. And this is why it might be that even some of your loved ones might be in a better place to be protected when judgment comes rather than other Christians because if you've been sharing the word with them, that word does not return void. Even if they have rejected it, it, it they've heard it. They are accountable for it. Whereas over here in, in religion land, they're not given the word. They're given slogans and they're given emotions and they're given hype and programs and feel good and, and all that. They don't have the word. You know, like Owen used to say, they, 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 uh, the, the preacher took one scripture and preached from it, a long way from it. <laughs> it's the word that transforms. It's the word that sanctifies and sets you apart. And that's really the only way we should see ourselves as set apart from the rest of the world. The, the, the Christian world has continually made this mistake as well. We're set apart because we do our hair a certain way or because we dress a certain way or because we do this or we don't do that. Well, all of that is external. Or the, you know, the prosperity gospel says to us, well, you know, they'll know you're, you're, you're God's children because you're, you know, your bling is prettier than somebody else's bling. Well, that's not it. It's in your heart where the difference is shown. And so in Daniel chapter 1 verse 6, it said, Among these who were spared from being wiped out by Nebuchadnezzar were children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them Daniel, he called Belteshazzar, and Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. But Daniel determined in his heart that he would not defile himself by eating his portion of the king's rich and dainty food, or by drinking the wine which the king drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might be allowed not to defile himself. Now God made Daniel to find favor, compassion, and loving kindness with the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, Well, I fear that lest my lord the king, who has appointed your food and your drink, should see your faces worse looking and more sad than the other youths of your age, that he would endanger my head with the king. And then Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over them, Prove your servants, I beseech you, for ten days. Let us be given a vegetable diet and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's rich dainties be observed and compared by you and deal with us, your servants, according to what you see. So the man consented to them in the matter and proved them ten days. And at the end of ten days, it was seen that they were looking better and had taken on more flesh than all the youths who ate of the king's rich dainties. Now, you might debate the, 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 the value of eating a natural diet rather than eating diets that are rich in fat and sugar and salt. You know, the four major food groups. You know, sugar, salt, fat, and preservatives. Okay, which is the four major food groups of what most Americans eat. But, I mean, but this is not just a natural matter here. It says that Daniel decided in his heart that he was going to do this. And really, the way that he had set this up with the, the master of the eunuchs, nobody but him and his three friends were going to know about this. Well, I have a term for this. This is another thing that we can do. In fact, we should be doing this. I call it personal symbolic 
resistance. Fasting is personal. In fact, if it's not, then you're really not doing it right. Keep the place here and go to Matthew chapter 6. And let me say, there are forms of symbolic resistance that are, that are done quite publicly, and I don't think that counts. Not as much as what's done personally. Okay, for example, you know, Colin Kaepernick made a, a big uh, splash in the news when he knelt, uh, when he was a football player, but he, he knelt and refused to stand at attention for the, the uh, national anthem being played at a, uh, at a ball game, which he claimed was a protest. It was a resist, it was an act of resistance. Okay, it was an act of resistance. <clears throat> okay, and how about uh, people who protest a, a, a police shooting, and so they, uh, they burn their neighborhoods down? Well, that is an act of resistance, but it's not personal. Not only that, it's harmful. There was, nobody was harmed by Daniel and his three friends doing this fast in secret. In fact, nobody would even know it was happening but them. So how would that have any effect upon anything? Well, it, it was honoring God and sticking their finger in the face of those spirits of Baal and those spirits that were, were operating in the kingdom. You know, there, there are spirits operating in our world we can't really do very much about. I mean, we can bind them with the authority of the name of Jesus, but that's about it. But you know what? You do that in private, that, that has more of an effect than you going out and carrying a sign or you, you starting a movement to resist that thing. Because you start a movement, I guarantee you the powers that be will, will come against that. This is personal. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 16, whenever you're fasting... Do not look gloomy and sour and dreary like the hypocrites, for they put on a dismal counsel, counsel, uh, countenance so that their fasting may be apparent and seen by men. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward already. That's not the kind of glory. That's not the kind of being apparent that God's looking for. That's religiosity there. But when you fast, perfume your head, wash your face, so that your fasting may not be noticed by men, but by your Father, who sees in secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you in the open. Go back to Daniel. Let me give you another example besides fasting. Daniel chapter 6, verse 3. Remember Daniel and his three friends, they were in the world, but they were not of the world. But they still functioned in important places of responsibility. It says in Daniel 6 verse 3, Daniel was distinguished above the presidents and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. <clears throat> you know, God is not God, God is not interested in half-hearted anything. He's not interested in half-hearted commitments. He's, you know, I, I think we kind of, we can kind of fall into a state where we think, oh, well, whatever, whatever little pittance we can give, that's good enough. Well, that is, whatever else you can say about it, that is not an excellent spirit. Excellence means you give it 100%. You give it all you got. It, it is good, and, and let me say, this kind of goes along with the personal resistance. Uh, let, let's, take, um, 
Let's take exercise. Just looking at something in the natural. Let's take uh, physical activity. You know, some people say, well, I'm overweight, so, so I, need to, I need to start an exercise program. So they walk around the block. Okay, maybe that's a good place to start. But you know, after a couple of times, walking around the block is easy. You're not going to lose that weight if all you do is just do the easy thing that you've always done. Sooner or later, you're going to have to walk two blocks, or you're going to have to walk half a mile, or you're going to have to go five kilometers. Okay, you, you're going to have to give it all you've got. You're going to have to go to your limit. If you don't go to your limit, you are not going to be a Daniel. You know, if you think, oh, well, well you know, what, God, whatever I give you, that's good enough because your grace is sufficient. We're not, the question is not whether his grace is sufficient. The question is whether what you've given him is excellent. Okay, Daniel had an excellent spirit. And the others were jealous of him. <clears throat> Verse 4, and so the, the presidents and satraps sought to find an occasion to bring an accusation against Daniel concerning the king kingdom, but they could find no occasion or fault, for he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. So then said these men, we shall not find any accusation against Daniel except we find it concerning the law of his God. Bingo! That's what the, the spirit of Antichrist is going to do to the body of Christ. Sooner or later, your Christian faith is going to run contrary to the laws of the land. And then the presidents and the satraps came tumultuously together to the king and said to him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom and deputies and satraps and counselors and governors have consulted and agreed that the king should establish a royal statute and make it a firm degree that whoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days except to you shall be cast into a den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it may not be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be altered. So, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows were open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, and he got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before God as he had done previously. Now he didn't go out in the middle of the public square and do this. You know, he didn't refuse to, to stand for, the, play, for the, the national anthem on national TV. He did it privately, but he didn't hide what he was doing. Okay, that is personal symbolic resistance. He didn't go before those presidents and satraps and say, you're a bunch of idolaters. The God I worship is the only true God and you're all going to hell. He didn't do that. He just did what he always did, but he refused to, to keep it hidden. All right, go to, back to Daniel chapter 4. There's something that Daniel exemplified. This is a hard one. I mean, not that any of these are easy. If they were easy, everybody would be doing them. Right? Daniel was courteous toward those who are opposed to him and opposed to God. Well, we're not, you know, they're disrespectable. They're evil people. We're not supposed to show them courtesy. Yes, you are. 
Jesus said, be good to your enemies. In fact, let's, let's read that one first. Keep the place in Daniel 4. Go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5, verse 43. says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you to show that you are children of the Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise upon the wicked and on the good and makes the rain fall on the upright and the wrongdoers alike. For if you love those who love you, what reward can you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? Can, do not even the drug dealers, do not even the human traffickers do the same? I mean, who else could I put in there? You know, we, we kind of maybe in America have too nice a view of tax collectors. I mean, a job with the IRS is kind of a, you know, a respectable thing here. But it wasn't for them. So I'm putting these other, you know, disrespectable uh, categories in here for you to get the point Jesus is making. If you only love those who love you and reward, uh, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brethren... What more than others are you doing? Do not even the Gentiles and the heathen do that? You therefore must be perfect. And that word does mean growing to complete maturity in godliness of mind and character. Having reached the proper height of virtue and um, integrity that your heavenly Father has. Okay, back to Daniel chapter 4. Here's what that looked like in the life of Daniel. As we know, as I talked about on Tuesday, <clears throat> the, the Lord used them to reveal secrets that none of the other soothsayers, magicians, astrologers, occultists could do. Now this tells us something. This tells us that in the eyes of ordinary people, what we are doing is woo woo, doo 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 doo. -do. It's weird, you know that that you listen. You the Holy Spirit talks to you. That's weird. Yeah. That's what the, that's what the normal people think about that. You should realize this: that to to ordinary unredeemed <laughs> natural people, being led by the Spirit is in the same category as having a crystal ball and eeny meeny the chili beany the spirits are about to speak. <laughs> Seriously. That's right. and, and, and that's what they did. They put Daniel and his three friends in, in with the occultists. But the occultists couldn't come up with the answer and the spirit revealed it to Daniel. A couple of times. And here in chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar has had this dream and the dream is God is warning him about judgment. And look look what Daniel does. I mean, boy, this would have been an opportunity to sock it to Nebuchadnezzar and say, you know what? You have been a tyrant. You know, you have been a wicked man and God is going to judge you so you better get down on your face and cry for mercy. But that's not what Daniel did. Look what, he, look what he said. Daniel 4 verse 27. He said, Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Look at the courtesy and the way he brought this forth. He said, Break off your sins and show the reality of your repentance by righteousness, by right standing with God and moral and spiritual rectitude, and liberate yourself from your iniquities by showing mercy and loving kindness to the poor and oppressed, that there may be possibly 
a continuance and lengthening of your peace and tranquility and a healing of your error. Now, Nebuchadnezzar didn't do that, and I suspect Daniel probably knew he wasn't going to, but he still, he still kind of held out the olive branch anyway. And look at verse 19. And Daniel, after he saw the understanding of this vision or dream that Nebuchadnezzar had had, it says, he was astonished and dismayed and stricken dumb and his thoughts troubled, agitated, and alarmed him. What he saw that was coming upon Nebuchadnezzar, it didn't please him at all. You know, I'll have to confess. Sometimes when I see how far America has, has strayed from the living God, and then I, I get the, the message through the spirit that judgment is coming upon America, sometimes... It's like, yeah, yeah, bring it on. And it's like, no. This is going to be awful. You don't know how awful it's going to be. But we've, we've got to get out of our, not only our Christian bubble, but we're, we need to get out of our American bubble. You know, we, we have been used since the end of World War II, we have been used to to a life of ease like human beings have never had and it can all disappear just like that. All that it would take would be a, an electromagnetic pulse over Kansas that would knock out all the power grid of the entire United States and we'd be stuck back in the pioneer days just like that. Look what happened back in February with, with an ice storm. Look what happened to Texas and that's nothing compared to what an EMP would do. And our enemies have those things, and they could do it any day now. And that, that's, that's ugly to, to contemplate. So Daniel was distressed, distressed when, he, when he realized what the, the dream was telling Nebuchadnezzar. And the king said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or its interpretation trouble or alarm you. And Daniel answered, well, my Lord, may the dream be for those who hate you and its message for your enemies. See, even when we are opposed, even when we are talking to somebody whose ideology is completely uh, contrary to ours, we can still be respectful toward them. Let me give you a New Testament example of that. Keep the place in Daniel. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. And you know, a lot of the voices out there in the body of Christ and, and a lot of um, good right-thinking, patriotic Americans uh, don't do it this way. And, and for a long time, we, we've seen a ramping up of the rhetoric in our world where there's a lot of name-calling and there's a lot of, you know, anger and there's a lot of accusations. And I will have to say, it's been my experience. So it's like the thing there in Proverbs about Answer not a fool according to his folly. You know, if they're not going to listen to you, it's not going to do you any good. It's not going to do them any good for you to insult them. You know, you're just, make, you're just ramping up the battle to a higher level. And here in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24, it says, The servant of the Lord, verse 24, Daniel 2, verse 24, The servant of the Lord, which Daniel was, and we're supposed to be, must not be quarrelsome, fighting and contending. Instead, he must be kindly to everyone, mild-tempered, preserving the bond of peace. He must be a skilled and suitable teacher. Oh, well, yeah, we'll let Steve do that. <laughs> no, God is saying for us to do that. A skilled and suitable teacher, patient and forbearing, and willing to suffer wrong. He must 
correct his opponents with courtesy and gentleness in the hope that God may grant that they will repent. See, that's what Daniel was, was offering Nebuchadnezzar. Say, hey, Neb, if you'll repent, then this, this bad dream, this nightmare that you've had may not come to pass. In the hopes that they will repent and come to know the truth, that they will perceive and recognize and become accurately acquainted with and acknowledge it, and that they may come to their senses and escape out of the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him, henceforth to do God's will. Go back to Daniel chapter 2. When we are learning to be Daniels, it's a process. And just as it was with Daniel and his three friends, they were involved in this process. Daniel was for 70 years or more. He... He outlived Nebuchadnezzar and he outlived uh, Belshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar's son, or maybe it was even his grandson, I'm not sure. He lived on into, uh, you know, after the Persians came and conquered the Babylonians. He was carried away to Persia. He was, he was carried away captive twice. He was a survivor. So, being in it to survive... What does it take? Well, read Daniel chapter 2, verse 17. Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, so that they would desire and request mercy of the God of heaven concerning the secret that Daniel and his companions should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. And then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. And Daniel blessed the God of heaven. And Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. He changes the times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals the deep and secret things. He knows what is in darkness and the light dwells with him. Fourth thing about being a Daniel is being open openness to new revelation you know now it's easy to look at other Christians whatever you are and you say, oh, those poor benighted Methovabda Presbycostal Catholics, whatever. It's like, well, they don't know what we know. Well, you know what? That's not it either. You could say, well, you know, Owen and Irene came, they got a revelation to come outside the denominational world, so we're, not, we're non-denominational. Well, guess what? That isn't it either. Being non-denominational is not what being a Daniel means. Being a Daniel means you are always open to new revelation. You know, I think, I, I think Owen Cain got that through to me early on when he told me, whatever you know about God, there's more. So I never thought that, well, okay, I've found it right now. This is it. Yeah, Romans 8 is it. I got it right here in the box. I never thought that. But a lot of people do. You know, a lot of people think, well, I'm a Catholic, so it's right here. Or I'm a Baptist, so it's right here. 
Well, just because we're Romans 8 doesn't mean it's right here. You've always got to be open to new revelation. Go to Matthew, keep the place in Daniel. Go to Matthew chapter 11. Nor should you think, well, it's just it's too high and it's too complicated. You know, it, it, it's too, uh, you know, spiritual for me. I can't get it. No. Daniel and his three friends were not claiming that they had any special uh, ability that, that um, made them worthy of receiving the, the revelation that they asked God for. They just asked God for it, and they were serious about it, and they got it. And here's what Jesus says about that. Matthew 11, verse 25. At that time, Jesus began to say, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, and I acknowledge and openly and joyfully <laughs> to your honor declare that you have hidden these things from the wise and clever and learned and revealed them to babes, to the childish, untaught and unskilled. See, so even if you are untaught and unskilled, God can still reveal mysteries and, to, and secrets to you. Yes, Father, I praise you that such was your gracious will and good pleasure. All things have been entrusted and delivered to me by my Father, and no one fully knows and accurately understands the Son except the Father, and no one fully knows and accurately understands the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son deliberately wills to make him known. Back to Daniel chapter 2, verse 27. So, when their lives were on the line and none of the magicians and astrologers could, could uh, interpret this first dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, Daniel and his three friends were shown the dream and that dream, by the way, explains a lot of things that are going on in our time right now, by the way. But verse 27, Daniel answered the king, This secret which the king has demanded, neither the wise men, nor the enchanters, magicians, nor astrologers, nor the journalists, nor the talking heads on ABC, NBC, Fox, and CBS can show the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what it is that shall be in the latter days. That's now. God showed Daniel back then, 600 B.C., what's happening right now. And it says, Your dream and the visions in your head upon your, that you saw were this. And as for you, king... As you were lying upon your bed, thoughts came into your mind about what should come to pass hereafter, and he who reveals secrets was making known to you what would come to pass. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than anyone else living. So let's understand, we didn't qualify to get revelation knowledge. Right? But in order that the interpretation may be known to the king, that you may know the thoughts of your heart and mind. You know, it's always a great blessing to me when somebody comes up to me with a question, and it's like, how do I answer that? I say, Lord, give me something to tell them. And out of my mouth comes this answer that I know I did not know. And it satisfies them, and it's like, wow, I need to go write that down. That was a good one. <laughs> well, that's what Dan Daniel was saying to Nebuchadnezzar here. But see, let's don't put Daniel up on some kind of pedestal and, you know, we're trying to be a Daniel. Well, we're trying to be a son of God. Okay, go to Daniel chapter 12. Because God showed him all of this stuff 
about our time. And look what he said. When it was all said and done, at the end of the book of Daniel, chapter 12, verse 8, look what Daniel says. He says, I heard, but I did not understand. Well, what's he saying here? The things God showed him, he didn't have it all figured out. It was not all just neatly uh, organized in his mind. And so he said, Oh my Lord, what shall be the final end of these things? And the angel said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. And many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and tried and smelted and refined. But the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand. But the teachers and those who are wise shall understand. And that's what we become when we are open to new revelation. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. Just because the words of the prophets are in the Bible, and just because we read the life of Daniel and his three friends, or of Isaiah, Jeremiah, or Ezekiel, or any of them, and you think, wow, what, what heroes of the faith. And you know, the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews talks about the heroes of the faith. Let's realize we can be one of those too. That's not saying we're supposed to idolize them and say, oh, they're so high and mighty and I'm just a worm. No. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. It says, The prophets who prophesied of the grace which was intended for you, they searched and inquired earnestly about this salvation. They sought to find out to whom and when this was to come, which the Spirit of Christ working within them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. And it was then disclosed to them that the service they were rendering was not meant for themselves or their period of time, but for you. It was these various things which have now already been made plainly known to you by those who preach the good news, the gospel, to you. By the same Holy Spirit sent from heaven, and into these things the very angels long to look. So, brace up your minds, be sober, circumspect, morally alert. Wake up! That's what he's saying. Set your hope wholly and unchangeably on the grace that is coming to you when Jesus Christ the Messiah is revealed. There's something interesting in verse 13 telling us about grace and about revelation. And that is that they are interrelated. He says there's grace that's coming to us. That means we don't have that, that measure of grace. It's not something we're, we're walking in yet. Well, I thought, you know, Jesus did it all on the cross. He said it's finished, so how come we don't have all the grace? Because you don't have all the revelation. See, grace without revelation is lawlessness. You know, there, there's a lot of Christians out there, grace, 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 God loves me so much and, and all my sins are gone and they're not into the Word and they're out there living like the world and feeling great about it. 
That's called lawlessness. Okay, on the other side, revelation without grace is legalism. Well, the Lord said, do this and don't do that. And the Lord said, this is going to happen and that's going to happen. And you better line up or you're going to hell with no grace. Well, that's legalism. You know, this is one of those straight things, right? The, the truth is, is right down here in the middle, and it's like there's an interrelation between grace and revelation. That's what it says there. It says, brace up your minds and set your hope unchangeably on the grace that is to be revealed. If you're not open to new revelation, you're, that grace is not going to be revealed to you. Okay, I said I was going to give you a fifth one just for good measure. Go to Philippians chapter 4. We'll end with this. Whatever else you could say about Daniel and his three friends, I mean, hey, they were, they were carried away captive. It was against their will that they ended up in Babylon. And they were, for, they were thrown in and forced to be with these people who were really quite alien to their way of life and to their uh, values. Well, what did they do? Did they get depressed and sulk? Or did they, you know, cop an attitude and, well, we're better than all the rest of you? No. You know what they were? They were flexible. They rolled with the punches. And Paul says we should do this. In fact, Paul uses himself as an example. I mean, he rolled with the punches. Philippians 4 verse 11. He says, not that I'm implying that I'm in any personal want, for I have learned how to be content and satisfied to the point where I'm not disturbed or disquieted in whatever state I am. I mean, he can move to California and still be content. <laughs> I know how to be abased and to live humbly and in straightened circumstances. You know, a lot of Americans don't. A lot of Americans that have trouble with that. And I know how to enjoy plenty and live in abundance. And a lot of people would have trouble with that. They, they blow it all on self-indulgence. I've learned in any and all circumstances the secret of facing every situation, whether well-fed or going hungry, having a sufficiency and enough to spare, or going without and being in want. And here it is. I have strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. Now I'm calling that flexibility. It's in Christ. Flexibility in Christ. Jesus will stretch you. He will enable you to deal with whatever you have to deal with. And He's the only way that can happen. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm ready for anything and equal to anything through Him who infuses inner strength into me. I'm self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. Amen, Brother Ben, with the right brother's pen. I mean, this is, this is what our assignment is till Jesus comes back. <clears throat> and let me say, I think you understand... This is not a, a works program to earn your salvation. This is so we can be in the optimum place in the days that lie ahead. I mean, you cannot do this and still go to heaven. But I don't recommend it. You want to come through this smelling like a rose, don't you? Well, this, this is what the Lord showed me. That's how, how we do this. So, Father, thank you for showing us. And thank you, Father, for creating in us the power and the desire to be like Daniel in every way, not just in these ways, 
but in every way in which you show us by your spirit, your word, that we will hide, our, hide in our hearts your word so that we would not sin against you. And to you be all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.